Now we're inside today because we got about six inches of wet snow last night and it's uh, March 25th, actually Jen's birthday. So if you're around, wish her happy birthday, but don't know when this will come out. But anyways, um, we're inside. We might shoot a couple later today, but man, it's wet out there. We're getting pouring rain right now. And then all that snow yesterday, it's supposed to be close to 50 degrees today. We aren't shed hunting today. Um, last year, we found a nice set uh, um, Lucky's sheds on Jen's birthday. But regardless, this is a great time to talk about designing your hunting land. And this is a really important critical tip for designing any hunting parcel. It's something I talk about at times, but I wanna go through how important this is. We'll talk about the tip at the end and why it's so critical to where you hunt anywhere. Doesn't matter if it's private land, public land, it's really has to do with designing your hunt. In fact, this has a lot to do with my first book in 2012, Whitetail Success by Design. And the intro involves a, a mature buck coming through and leads up to that shot. And then in the conclusion, I talk about that this buck was shot on public lane in the UP of Michigan, 45 minutes in from the car or from the truck. And it's, it talks about this concept and how I was using this concept when I go in to hunt that buck and how that applies to not only every parcel we design, but also every public land hunt and every hunt that we go on. Jen and I talked about in our podcast this morning, uh, that'll be out, out on Thursday the 27th, we talk about, um, or Thursday the 28th, we talk about that um, this is a critical concept for everything we do out on this land. And if you follow the concepts, it leads to success. So this works anywhere. And that's really, really critical to understand that a lot of the best whitetail concepts of hunting or land design, if they're based on how whitetails relate to each other and how whitetails relate to hunters and how you should hunt the land, then that concept applies anywhere. Anywhere a whitetail roams. Doesn't matter what state you're in, what type of habitat you have, the concepts rule. Doesn't matter if you're designing your plan and your buck management and how you hunt bucks on your land or how it relates to where you want to scout on public land and find deer and really set up your entire hunt. This works anywhere as do all the concepts that we manage with. That's why I wrote them and wrote about them in 2012 in that book, White Tail Success by Design, my first book. You have to have this for mature bucks because if you don't have it, it has to do with how much room you have left left over for mature bucks and if you don't have room and enough cover for them then you don't have mature bucks always remember food mature bucks aren't bedding out in the food source where does and fawns are at doe family groups they're not bedding in the middle of those does and fawns they're not bedding in the middle of your hunting access you might see does and fawns stand up and watch you go by but you don't see the oldest buck in the neighborhood stand up 50 yards away and watch you go by so hunter access route hunting, hunter parking routes roads houses, doe family groups, food source, open food sources, mature bucks aren't bedding there. And a lot of people seem to forget that concept. If they don't have enough left over for a mature buck to bed in after you X out everything else, lakes too, ponds, areas where they can't bed, the bedding habitat's not hospitable to bedding, then you're not gonna have mature bucks because they're the last ones in the line. Does, food, all those other things, open waterways, inhospitable cover. All those areas take precedence and if there's any room left over for mature bucks are there. There's a concept for that that I, that I talk about. This creates easier hunting because once you have an area where mature bucks are at during the daylight, that's a very sacred spot. That's why I call it the 5% club, even the 3% club where only three to 5% of all the hunting parcels in the neighborhood or the area or your areas on public land actually can house mature bucks during the daylight. It's a very sacred area. Because most people overpressure, most people have too much food, most lands have too many does and fawns, and when you look at all that as a whole, there's not a lot of property left over that doesn't get pressured, that has good food, has good cover, and doesn't have too many does and fawns. So when you X that out, there's really not much left over. And when you have it, it creates a lot easier hunting because mature bucks are over here, does and fawns are over here. Mature bucks are over here during the daylight, meaning you can get in typically in the morning before they get there. Gives you morning stands. You hunt closer to the food where they're going because you're not going to have that area where mature bucks are if you don't have that consistent all season long food source that they can relate to every afternoon 
So that gives you afternoon stands, gives you morning stands back where they're at, gives you all day stands in betweens. It helps you separate and know where does and fawns are versus bucks. Does and fawns are easy to target and shoot. Mature bucks are individual creatures. I want to hit this point. I'm going to hit this a lot in, in the coming videos. Does and fawns think as a group. 15, 12 at a time, 10 at a time, 8 at a time. You've seen herds of 40 or 50 during the winter time. Huge herds. I've seen herds over 100. But bottom line is when one of those does runs, they all run. You could have a fawn blow and run off the, off the food source or an open area and all the does and fawns run. And I would believe that 90% of them don't even know why they're running. They all just run because one ran, they all ran. Mature buck is different. He runs because he determines that it's unsafe. Now, if he's grouped in with all those does and fawns, like late season food sources, winter food sources, maybe during the summer at times out in open fields, he runs with them. But by and large, the majority of his lifetimes, he thinks and acts as one, and that's kept him alive. He makes decisions on his own. Let's look at it this way, just simple math. There's 20 does and fawns out in the field, and one hears a noise or is a little edgy and runs. They all run. That was one out of 20 made a decision. That means the other 19 didn't learn a dang thing. They don't know what spooked them. They don't know what scared them. They just simply ran. That's herd mentality. Mature buck, if he's out there alone, and let's face it, the older he gets, the less buddies he has. They get picked off. He makes decisions by himself. So it's not diluted in one out of 20 decision making or one out of 30 or one out of 10 or recognizing what happened 20% of the time when he's by himself and he makes a decision, it's 100% of the time. He heard something, he saw something, he smelled something and he took off and he learns that over and over again, sometimes 20 times more than does that would be within a big family group that just run when someone in the group runs. Mature bucks are very different creatures. Depth of cover, that's what we're talking about, depth of cover. I coined that phrase a long time ago because that determines where and if a mature buck will bed, you have to have enough depth of cover. Well, look at this right up here, this is really simple. Food, cover, food. That's a line of movement. That could be the outside, outside, and inside of a 40 acre parcel. If there's only 50 yards of space in most areas, then there's not enough room left over in that cover there's only 100 yards of cover for a mature buck to bed because does and fawns fill that. There's food on either side that's consistent. There's no location left for a buck. Let's say this is 500 yards in between. So that's 1,000 yards between food source. Now mature bucks and bucks in general, older bucks can find their own space in the middle. Does and fawns and younger bucks can layer between them in the middle. So then you actually have an area, a daylight sacred area in the middle where bucks and does can go. So they have enough room on either side where those bucks and does can be and they can layer, they can layer back. Cause then you have those concepts where does and fawns and young bucks, bucks. And then you finally have this older age class of bucks right there in the middle and there's enough room. Shrink that down to 50, you don't have enough room. Now in a wilderness setting, you might want a thousand yards because deer are used to space and they'll take it. They're creatures of low stress, especially an older buck, the older he becomes. Does and fawns are herd mentality. They'll bed all together. There are certain does, dominant does, that don't like other dominant does. They'll separate, they'll self-align, but they think and act as a group. They'll, they're totally happy bedding closer to the food source, human commotion, parking areas than a mature buck. Might be a thousand yards. So you might have 2,000 yards of space in that mature buck will bed in the middle. When I shoot mature bucks in the UP of Michigan on public land, I'm typically back three quarters of a mile to a mile from known baiting areas where hunters come in from different two tracks and stopping points and go 100 yards into their blind and bait. That becomes that afternoon food source or actually right after dark. Mature buck might get there an hour after dark where I'm seeing him in the middle and hunting in his bedroom where he's at 90% of the time during daylight. And that area is three quarters of a mile to a mile because they have lots and lots of space. There's no hunters in between. And that's the depth that they take. Northern Ohio, maybe you could sandwich them in between 200 yards where you have 200 yards between major food sources. So think of that, you have to have that depth. Maybe that depth is food source, cover, then a house. Then those bucks again have to be in the middle. 
Those does and fawns might bed closer to the house, but you have to have that depth where it goes back. Maybe that depth on the one side, there's food, 300 yards of cover, and then a swamp system. Well, maybe those bucks are right back against that swamp system because there's 250 yards of cover before you hit the does and fawns right up against food source. They have that depth, depth of cover. You know what I explain about in my, in my book, Whitetail Success by Design, I talk about where a 40 acre parcel, where you have five acres of food in the middle, you can't go 155 yards in any direction before you're off the property. So that's, that's your depth. And when the depth is overall is 440 yards, then 150 out of 55 out of 440 is a very, very poor ratio. Take a 20 acre parcel, and I show this illustration in that book, put the five acre food source in the, in the front. Now you have 330 yards of cover between there, or th over 300 yards of cover between the five acre food source and the back of the property. Now you actually have enough depth that you can actually sandwich food in. You have that rectangular food source in the front. Now you have bucks that have enough depth. So by the time you get to the back of that parcel, that 20 acre parcel is worth more than that 40 acres if you can't change the food source. Because the 20 acre has enough uh, depth and depth of cover, the 40 acre does not. So if you can't change it, make sure you buy the 20 in that case instead of the 40. Now, if you get to the back of that 20 and there's a big ag field, and there's some hunting pressure on that end, then your depth again is in the middle. And your sandwich, you don't have that much depth. You have basically 300 and some yards between food sources. That buck has to be right in the middle of that if he has any room left over at all. And a lot of times when you're in ag areas and you have higher deer numbers, that's where when you have too many does and fawns, it just fills that space and destroys your depth of cover because more does and fawns fill that space of cover and there's no room left over for bucks. Bucks take what's left over they don't dictate and seize what's there and what's most favorable to begin with. Does and fawns do that. Bucks have everything left over. That has to do with food, pressure, does, and cover. You have to look at that determines depth of cover. You find that, doesn't matter if you find it on public land, you build it on private land, you have to recognize depth of cover. And if you do, that concept applies anywhere. Going back to the intro and conclusion, on my first book in 2012. That eight point was there because of the depth of cover, all those layering of does and beds, perpendicular access to hunt to that line of movement where you're coming in at a 90, instead of walking along the movement and spooking out the entire area. Those concepts work anywhere a whitetail roams. And this concept is one of the most critical that you can learn and apply to your hunt this fall.